chapter 2, and then one, two sections from chapter 4. First Peter chapter 2, first of all, First Peter chapter 2, verse 19 through verse 21. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. But what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. The word suffering occurred three times in that passage. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer shall live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is try you, as though some strange thing happen unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of the glory of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The word suffering occurring five more times in the, in the chapter. Now, Father, we ask you to bless upon the message today, and we kneel before thee in great need, this congregation great need, who can minister to... So many people, I can't carry them, Lord, as a nursing father carries a child as bosom, and they need your ministry, not mine. They need thee, not me. There's nobody that can minister like you can. There's nobody that can comfort like you can. There's nobody that can apply the Word of God like you can. And unless you undertake forth in this hour, all is lost and wood, hay, and stubble. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God will bless the Word of God today and take these lessons and drive them home and apply them and confirm the words of truth that we preach. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm talking about a very important subject this morning, a very serious subject, and a subject which I've never attempted to preach for just in so many words about. I've preached to you on trouble in the Christian and why the righteous suffer, but I want to preach to you this morning on sorrow and suffering in this passage. Sorrow and suffering. A man said, <clears throat> God sent one man into this world without sin, but that man was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You read the Bible very much, you'll see that whoever wrote the Bible has a kindred spirit with your spirit. Many times you get feeling sorry for yourself, spend some time in the Bible and see what's going on. Here's David going up the steps, covering his head. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I have died for thee? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Does that uh, strike a responsive chord in you? Maybe someday it will. Here's Jacob in the house. In come the boys. They got this coat soaked in blood. And they said, whose is it, Daddy? And he said, it's Joe's. And he said, you bring down my gray hairs to the grave with grief, sorrow. Here's Micah's husband trailing along behind him and happily married, I suppose, four or five years. David's taking her back and taking her away from him, which is forbidden in De Deuteronomy, but David was no sinless person either. And here he's walking along behind her weeping. And he can't keep her. He's got uh, the captain of the guard, Joab, to deal with, and uh, Abner to deal with, and they'll cut off his head if he makes a move. Here's Sisera's mother back at home waiting for Sisera to come back and tell about what a great battle they had and how they got all the prey, and she waits all her life. He never comes back. Did you ever wait for a boy to come back and he never came back? Christians don't read the Bibles enough. They read the Bibles, they don't think about what they're reading enough. This is a woman waiting for a boy to come home. The father, his prodigal, came home after a while. Sister never got home. He had put slapped through the head with a nail and nailed to the ground. Can you imagine the scene, what it was like when Adam and Eve buried Abel? First death, human death on this earth. Of course, the sheep died for that. But the first man that died was Abel. He was killed. Mom and dad had buried him. Mom and dad had buried him while they are standing there, his brothers there and the near about some place, and there one of their boys killed the other boy, murdered the other boy in the same family. The Bible's filled with that kind of thing. You'll slam through Matthew chapter 2 and hear much of mothers trying to protect their two-year-old, one-year-old babies. 
How many of you have children under two years old? May I see your hands? All right, suppose the door opens, come right now, and they come in, and they got nothing but swords and knives, and go through the nursery and start killing them. How would you feel about that? They did in Matthew too. All the babies in Bethlehem under two years old. You're a mother. Wouldn't you throw yourself across the body of that baby? Wouldn't you claw that soldier and tear at his hair and bite him and kick and curse him and something to protect your little old baby? That Bible is filled with that kind of thing. Now, when an unsaved man looks at that, here's what he says. He says, either God can prevent these terrible things from happening, and he won't. That's proof God's bad. Or else God wants to prevent these terrible things from happening, and he can't. Therefore, he's not omnipresent. Unsaved man got that thing all figured out philosophically. And he figures God either can do it and won't, or he can't do it. But that isn't right. The, the fact that the fellow would say a thing like that shows something. Suffering makes philosophers out of men. You have to think. Suffering will make you think. And if God can't get your attention, he'll put pain on you, and after a while you begin to think. Brethren, the basic realities of life are sin, sorrow, and death. The basic realities of life are not love and sharing. That's the luxuries. The basic facts of life, the root realities are, you're born to die, you commit sin, and you suffer. That's basic. That's negative. A man that doesn't think about death, sin, and suffering is not an intelligent man. You know, I know those fellows like Marx and Engels and those fellows are a bunch of stupid, idiotic, lame brains, and I say that with charity. They never discussed death and sin and individual suffering. They talk about mass of suffering and class of suffering, but not individuals. They couldn't deal with human beings. They didn't know how to deal with human beings. Those fellows weren't intelligent. People suffer. Pain knocked at my door and said she had come to stay. Though I would not welcome her, but bade her go away, still she entered like my shade. She followed after me, and from her stabbing, stinging sword, no moment was I free. And then one day another knocked most gently at my door. I cried, no, pain is living here. There's no room for any more. Then I heard his tender voice, it is I, be not afraid. And from that day he entered in, the difference that it made. But though he did not bid her leave, my strange unwelcome guest, he taught me how to live with her. And no one ever guessed that we could dwell so sweetly here, my Lord, and pain and I, within this fragile house of clay, while years slipped slowly by. You have to have some attitude, some You've got to adopt some philosophy or some attitude about pain and suffering because one of these days, pain and suffering are going to get to you, and when they do, you're going to have to develop some kind of philosophy about it. Richard Vern Braun said old-time communists who were victims of Stalin's purges used to pray in their cells. Why, Vern Braun's in jail under the oh, new regime, and in that jail are communists. What are they doing in jail? They just wouldn't go along with Stalin dictatorship. So he jailed his own crowd. And there are a bunch of communists in jail, and what are they doing? They're praying. They're praying in jail. These are the fellows who profess to be atheists. That suffering made them, you know, had to think twice. Stalin, quote, may God give success to the operation. <laughs> thought the guy was an atheist. Zenofi, president of the Communist International, his last words were, listen, Israel, our God is the only God. I thought he was an atheist. You know what happens? They suffer. They get near death and they have to think about it. Pain, suffering, and sorrow will make you think. He'll go to Soviet minister of the interior affairs. There must be a God for my sins have reached me. Yaroslavi, president of the League of the Godless, to Stalin, quote, burn all my books. Look, he is here. He waited for me. Burn my books. Khrushchev learned how to read by reading the Bible. Stalin Mikhailovich went to seminary. Those communists have to philosophize. There's something stronger than just sitting around saying atheism, atheism, man. Pain shows up. You've got to do something with it. Suffering shows up. You've got to do something with it. The little white casket shows up. You've got to think, man. You've got to think. You just can't just mess around. Make you philosophize. Now, what answers do men propose for suffering? A fellow comes back from Vietnam with both his arms and legs gone. They didn't have much of that in Vietnam. They had a lot of that in World War I. 
concussion, mortar shell, blow off the arm, blow off the leg. He's had a lot of that basket cases. They have names for quadriplegic and those little, you know, fancy you know, kind of funny names they get to make you feel better. Those kind of things. All that kind of stuff there. How does man handle that? Number one, the first thing that man does, he's, he rejects God and says, well, I won't believe in a God that can't stop that stuff, so as far as I'm concerned, there's no God. That's atheism. That's one answer. You want to answer that way? Help yourself. Free country. Now, there's one problem. If you're an atheist, life is meaningless. If it's meaningless, pain and suffering are meaningless. If they're meaningless, you suffer and hurt just like an animal suffers and hurt, and there's no point to it. You know why communist countries major in torture and terrorism? Because pain means nothing to them, therefore it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. Laugh at you in pain because there's no point to it. A second solution men do. They go to what they call escapism. What's that? That's uh, drugs. Get stoned. Drink it off. Tell a few jokes. Eat, drink, and be merry. Forget it. <laughs> That's Buddhism. I studied Buddhism. I was trying to escape it. I knew life was a mess. I knew everything wrong with life you could know before I was 27 years old, but I couldn't find the answers. In Buddhism, you sit cross-legged, you get out of the frame, and you get away from it. You trip without drugs, what you do. You obtain project enlightenment, and after a while you've got to come back in the frame and face the mess again. You've got to meditate and get out of it again. That's escapism, trying to run from it. I said, I will forget the dying faces. The empty places will be filled again. O oh, voices mourning deep within me cease. Vain, vain, the word, how vain, not in forgetting lieth peace. I said, I will crowd action upon action. The strife of faction will stir my spirit to flame. O oh, tears that drown the fire of manhood cease. Vain, vain, the word, hopeless, not in endeavors lieth peace. I said, I will accept the breaking sorrow which God tomorrow will his son, his son explain. Then did the turmoil deep within me cease. Not vain that word, not vain, for an acceptance lieth peace. The Christian has an answer to these things. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're unsafe, you haven't got any answers. You may have to answer some problem when it comes to sorrow and suffering and pain and death, you have not got them. <laughs> and the most intelligent men that ever lived haven't got them. I'll tell you another way they explain suffering. They, this is what we call the stoic attitude, stoicism. A fellow says, well, I can't understand it, but stiff upper lip, you know, harden yourself, toughen yourself. That's how the cookie crumbles, boys. <laughs> Tough apples, that's how the snow blows. That's the way a stoic handles those things. I mean, just let it go. Epictus, one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, said this. He said, the way to harden yourself against sorrow is begin your household and break all your utensils. And as you break them, say, I don't care, and break something cheap. And they get something more expensive and break it, and say, I don't care, and bust it. And after a while, you get the most expensive things you have, then set fire to the house <laughs> and say, I don't care. <laughs> and that's how you get used to it. That way you can get used to suffering by gradually convincing yourself, I don't care, I don't care. Let me tell you something. Suicide is one of the best ways to escape problems that you ever saw. And if you believe in escapism, why don't you just blow your brains out if you want to get away from it? Well, you've got the situation you're in. You want to escape it, just blow your brains out. Somebody said, I never heard a fellow said from a pulpit. They're singing that in songs out in California. Out in California the last year, more than 500 teenage kids have killed themselves. And the newspapers and radio and magazines are shocked about it. You shouldn't be shocked about it. The rock songs say do it. The rock songs say it's all right. The rock songs say it's one way out. Escape. That's how they handle suffering. I'll tell you another way men handle suffering. Scientism. What's scientism? Well, science comes along, the educated fellows, and say, well, just be patient. <laughs> In a few thousand years, we'll straighten out your problem. <laughs> just sit still, we'll get to the moon, give us 400,000 years, give or take a few hundred thousand. Science are very exact. And we'll figure the thing all out for you and fix you up. Hey, fellow, talking like that, I... Feel like saying, shut your mouth and stop air pollution. <laughs> I've got a poem. If man should ever reach the stars, there's one thing that is clear. He'll ruin everything up there just like he did down here. <laughs> and folks say, oh, face, oh, that's pessimism. No, man, no, man. That's not pessimism. That's reality. That's telling like it is. Now, what are the cause of sorrow and suffering? Well, there are three or four. First of all, you've got to consider nature. Nature. 
Suppose a tornado rips this place apart, and here we find the bodies of a loved one lying around here in a few hours. What are you going to do about that? You can't control nature. You can't control tidal waves. You can't control earthquakes. I was out someplace uh, preaching, I guess it was, I can't even remember now. Oh, I was up in North Red Line, Pennsylvania. And that earthquake while we were up there shook the pictures off the wall in the church. We're standing here, I'm preaching, all of a sudden the ground opens up from here and opens on right up to Nine Mile Road. <laughs> nice little crack, a half mile wide and 300 feet deep. What's science going to do for you? <laughs> Why, scientists can't, they can't stop a hurricane or a tidal wave. When these hurricanes come through here in September, you know what the scientists do? They just curse and put on a show. They can't do anything. If they're saved, they pray. If they're unsaved, they get drunk. You can't stop that stuff. There's something wrong with nature. The Bible says the whole creation groans and travails together in pain till now. Why, people, there are people in California have had lost ones that got killed in hurricanes or, or earthquakes. There are people out there in California that have if forest fires have killed people, there are people on the Gulf Coast area that love them and killing hurricanes. Nature, suffering can cause you. You can you can have a funeral because of a hurricane. You can have a funeral because of a tidal wave. Nature, a rip tide or an ebb tide down on the beach won't wait for your five or six year old boy. Carry him out to sea. That's the cause of suffering. Scientific progress. I don't believe in scientific progress. I believe there's something wrong with nature. No scientist can fix. Shark. Feed on codfish. Codfish feed on herring. Herring, it takes them 6,000 plankton to make one meal. And the plankton feed on algae, and it takes them 10,000 plants to get one meal. <laughs> you got the plankton eating the algae. Then you got the herring eating the plankton. Then you got the cod eating the herring. You got the shark eating the cod. Something's wrong. <laughs> we go out and kill the sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Something's wrong, man, with nature. A man said birds could live without man, but men could not live without birds. If you kill all the birds, in ten years the insects would take everything you've got. You couldn't grow a crop in ten years if it weren't for birds. Something wrong with nature. Dog eat dog. How many of you ever been bit by a snake? Let me see your hand. Have been by a snake? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Well, how come that snake didn't just come up and shake your hand? <laughs> Nothing's wrong with that snake. She <laughs> bit me a bite There's something wrong with that snake. There's something wrong with nature. Let me tell you, if you believe in reincarnation, don't come back as a shrimp or a shad minnow. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in the water feeds on shrimp or shad minnows. And you say, why is that? There's something wrong with human nature. Here are these fellows out West Florida University. I haven't got the sense God gave us stuff yak. And they're sitting around in the classrooms talking about evolution and man's inhumanity to man and human rights. Listen, stupid. If you came from animals, for you the law of the jungle is the one you go by. Don't you talk to me about human rights. Get off that. Get off the ki the little goody, little goody two-shoe stuff, okay? Got stuff about human rights and helping folks out. If you came the jungle, it's the law of the jungle. Me first and you next. Do what others for, they do unto you. There's something wrong with nature. I'll tell you something else that causes you suffering, the presence of conscience. Wouldn't it be a great thing if God created you with no conscience? Some would be pretty happy if you didn't have any conscience. You know one thing that causes you suffering? Your conscience. Guilt will cause you to suffer, whether you like it or not. A violated conscience will not be still until you kill it. And it takes time and money to kill it. <laughs> A lot of people go to the shrink, you know, try to get the shrink to kill it for them. I like this poor man of Russell. I visit a shrink to be psychoanalyzed, to find out why I killed my cat and blacked my husband's eyes. He laid me, he laid me an office couch to see what he could find, and here's what he dredged from my unconscious mind. When I was one, I hid my dolly in a trunk, and so it follows, I'm always drunk. When I was two, I saw my father kiss the maid one day, and that is why I suffer from kleptomania. At three, I had a feeling of ambivalence toward my brothers, and so it follows. Naturally, I poison all my lovers. But I'm now happy and adjusted by these lessons I've been taught, because everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. <laughs> now, you get your conscience to a thing like that, you can live with yourself, but conscience will give you, have a, give you a hard time. Cause you to suffer. Suffer. Sit around feelings of guilt. You say, what do you do about those things? I get them right. I get them right. If something I can make right, I make it right. If something ought to get right, I get it right. 
If I can't get it right, then don't worry about it. If it shouldn't be right, I don't let the devil give me false conviction. Don't sit around and drive yourself nuts over something you have no control over and nothing can be done about. Get it under the blood. All right, three, the moral laws of the universe can cause suffering. You say, who set them up? God set up the universe with laws in it. The star, the moon, the stars, and their courses follow laws. Gravitation, the centrifugal, the laws, you see. There's a moral law to this universe. God gave it the Ten Commandments. And history shows 20,000 times an hour for 6,000 years that the people who try to obey those laws make out better in the long run than the people who violate them. If you attempt to keep the Ten Commandments, you'll always make out better than a fellow who don't. You doubt it? All right, here's a boy on a wheel. They used to do this back in 12, 13, 1400. They call it breaking on the wheel. And here's a big ox cart wheel sitting up here, and it's about six feet in diameter, and it's up on a platform, and they take a guy on it and twist this elbow this way, and twist this one this way, and tie into the rim. And take one leg and turn it this way, and tie at the rim, turn the other one, turn it out that way, and tie at the rim. Then the executioner comes up there with a thing like a piece of gas pipe, about three feet long, and about an inch thick, and he's entitled to bust 40 bones before they turn that fellow loose. He has 40 wax at him. Cross the knuckles, cross the wrist, cross the elbow. That's called breaking on the wheel. When they get through that guy, he's busted in 40 places. And they take him off the wheel. Well, of course, he dies. You say, what for? For breaking the Ten Commandments. That was the punishment for murder back in those days. Or adultery if you got caught with the wrong person. Break him on the wheel. Don't you know that fellow suffered? Can you imagine the suffering that suffering comes from? It comes from disobeying the moral laws of the universe. In China, for murder, you know what they give them? They give them what they call the cut, of the, the, the death of a thousand cuts. I've read accounts by fellows who've seen it. Said he's out in the crowd, he couldn't see what was going on the platform. About 2,000 people there, but hear the man scream. Hear him scream two miles off for almost an hour. And put him down to blubbering and gibbering, and then finally silenced. And after the crowd left, he went there on the platform and found what was up there. About 40 pieces of flesh lying around there. The executioner takes a knife and cuts off the end of the thumb. Then one piece off the ear. Then a chip off the thigh about the size of a half dollar. Then one toe in the back of the heel. Then three inches off your calf. Then some off the tongue. One side of the nose. Don't you know that suffering? You suffer like that? Well, the fellow's suffering like that because he broke the moral laws. The moral laws cause you suffering. Let me ask you this. What are people doing over in India tonight, dying in the street? Don't you know mothers and daddies in India hate to lie down in the street and see their babies starve to death? What they do? Violate the first law. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. India's got as many gods as it's got animals. I'm telling you, the moral law causes suffering. It's a, it's a cause of suffering. You ever go down to Mexico and see the condition they're in down there? Or South America, some of those places? What's the problem? I'll tell you the problem. They violated the second law. Thou shalt not make to thee any graven image. All right, finally, I'll tell you something that caused suffering. The presence of a loving father. You say, how could a loving father cause suffering? Well, I have some of you kids. <laughs> I have some of you kids... 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, hasn't your mother and daddy caused you to suffer? Oh, come on, he has too. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't tell me, but you, you felt real sorry for yourself when you got in the room and cried, didn't you? And all the work your mom and daddy made you do and cleaning up the dishes and always yelling at me and always doing this and always doing that and keeping rules and regulations, I can't do this and can't do that. You know, a loving father, you know what he'll do sometimes? He'll sometime, you get a little bit older, he'll let you choose to your own mistake. He'll, you want freedom of choice? You want to be your own boss? You know, loving father do after he's done all he can to make you do right? You won't do right? You know what he'll do? He'll let you go. He'll let you go and get the biggest mess you ever saw and come back crying, well, why'd you let me do it? That's how we are. Well, let me ask you this. If God had chosen for you and you'd suffered, wouldn't you blame him? You know what God will do? He'll let you suffer by your own choice. Now you can blame yourself. You can learn something. Why well, you take you take my kids, you know, I try to teach my kids, all of them, to do the best they can. You think that doesn't take some pressure sometimes? What's this D doing this report card? What's this C doing here? How come you got a C when you're 
messing around the church last night and messing around over at somebody's house and visit and doing this and that when you should have been studying, you could have made a better grade. I caused them to suffer. <laughs> what am I trying to teach them? I'm trying to teach something that will be a blessing to them later. You take the prodigal, the boy going out there, why, that boy, you know what his attitude was? His attitude was, my life's my own life, I can live my own life, I can live my own life, where I want to live my own life. You know what he wanted freedom from? Rules and regulations. The old man didn't want that freedom for him. You know what the old man wanted? The, one, the old man wanted to have him be free from the entanglements of sin so he could enjoy life. The loving father looks at it different you look at it. You say, get me out from these rule regulations. The old man says, well, get right first. Then when you get out from underneath them, you, you won't mess up again, get entangled again. Your father wants real freedom for you. Let me ask you this. You're a daddy. You've got two boys playing in the room, or three like Brother McGee has, or I've had. I've had three of them there. I know that, you know, of David knocking Mike and Mike knocking Pete and David... You know, he did it, he did it, he did it. Now, you come out, you don't know who did it. I have to hit all three of them. <laughs> and, and you come in that room, and here are these three boys trying to build this tower out of blocks, and it keeps falling down. And it's your fault. I did not. You touch it. I did not. Wang, 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 all kind of stuff. And you got the block. I pick the block. You touch the block. That kind of business. What are you going to do about that? You think about that? I mean, can't you, if you're an omnipotent father, can't you just walk in there and stand there and supervise every move so nobody makes a mistake and it gets built? Can't you take all the three boys in the back room and beat all three of them and beat them raw and bloody until they go there and they're afraid to say something to each other and get the thing built right? You know what a loving father will do? He'll use restraint. I mean, he may say something, interfere once in a while, but he'll stand back and let those boys work that thing out because they'll never build anything and know how to build anything, learn how to do it without help, and they never learn how to live together until they live together. And cause suffering. I give it trouble. Lord knows what he's doing. Now, finally, I'm going to talk about the purposes, the purposes behind sorrow and suffering. Number one, this is the main thing, education. Education. Folks talk about education, going to school, one of the greatest education you ever got, you got from walking along with pain and suffering. A man wrote these words, I walked ten miles with pleasure. We chattered all the way, but she left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and not a word, said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when the sorrow walked with me. Sorrow and suffering can teach you things that God can't teach you any other way. You take a man in the Bible, a man after God's own heart, great man. He wrote over half the Psalms. That fellow one time got in some bad trouble. He paid for it all his life. One of his boys raped his own sister, then got murdered by his own brother. One of his sons rose up in the begging against him and got murdered by a general. That a boy had a time of it. He had learned some things. His name was David. And you know what David thought? David thought sin was a serious thing in other people. But in his own personal life, it didn't amount to much. And he had to learn something. He had to learn that sin is serious in anybody's life, including yours. Some of you have a very, you've got a very scriptural view of sin in the lives of other people. Now, thank God you do. You know what sin is in the lives of other people. And thank God you do. You know what's right and what's wrong. But, you know, you've got to realize it's just as serious in you as it is in somebody else. And since you don't realize that, you go through a little uh, education. David learned something. By what he paid from that sin, he learned that sin was bad in him as well as anybody else. Tell you something else he learned. He learned when you lose a clear conscience, you've lost one of the most valuable things you've got in this earth. I'd be the most valuable thing in this earth outside of salvation is good health. But I'll tell you, a clear conscience would sure run it for its money for second place. If you've got a clear conscience, you can put up with bad health. But a man with good health and a a bad conscience has made a great loss. I'll tell you something else David learned about suffering. And he suffered. He learned that pretense will play out. He learned you can cover up a thing and pretend only so long and after a while that thing will get out. You can't get out of the bag every time. May you stand there and cover a while, but pretty soon it'll come out. You might just well not pretend. You might just well leave the card on the table face up. I'll tell you something else he learned. 
He learned that forgiveness does not come quickly and doesn't come easily. Doesn't the Bible say if we confess our sin, there's faith and justice to forgive us our sin? Yes, yes, but you see, that's doctrinal. That has to do with your standing before God. That thing there, there's more to it when you get to fellowship. When it comes to fellowship, you may confess that thing and get forgiveness and cleansing just like that, see? But then back in fellowship with God is something else. I've seen the old gospel train go along like this. Maybe that isn't a good thing, uh, gospel, because I don't believe a man can lose salvation. I don't believe that. But let's put it this way. Here's your fellowship with the Lord, and it's a choo-choo, and it's going down the track toward home. And I've seen many a Christian get off that choo-choo and then get back on later. And you can get back in fellowship later. But when you get back in, there's always something you missed. And when you get back in, there's five cars ahead of you that weren't there before. And when you get back in, there's a car missing that was there when you got off. It isn't easy. It isn't done just like that. God is not a bellboy that you just snap your finger for like that. God is interested in remaking the lives of people so they can enjoy serving Him. Now you think about that. God is interested in remaking people so they can enjoy serving Him. He's not a glorified bellboy. Oh, Lord, I got such a headache this morning. Oh, God, my head just splitting. Oh, Lord, take this headache. How about praying for God to take the liquor away from you that gave you the headache? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I mean, always ringing the button for God. Oh, God, please help me pay my bills. Oh, God, I'm behind. I want to graduate, and I can't pay my bills. I won't take the finals. And, oh, God, to throw some money my way. <laughs> well, how about asking for a job back there when you were doing nothing? And how about ask for grace to keep on the job after he gave you the job? And how about ask for wisdom what to do with the money when you got the money? Amen. All right, I'll tell you something else about suffering, what it's for. Not only for education, to educate you, but to give you spiritual insight. If you're saved, God is interested in your Christ-likeness. A man said, well, I don't see what a miracle it was about Stephen getting stoned to death. And a fellow said, well, the fact that he prayed for his enemy is a miracle. I mean, you got something out of that. you got to admit there's something to that, boy. Well, you can pray for a guy while he's killing you and ask God to forgive him. There's something going on there. Spiritual insight. I hate to say it, but sometimes only pain can divert our attention from this world. I hate to think about that. My flesh cringes just like you, yours does. But 20th century man is the condition of a church father who said... God wants to give us something, and 20th century man has got so much in his hands, there's no place to put it. God Almighty has to make you hurt, and then you look up. Sometimes it takes, some, some of you folks, it's going to take pain to get, to, for God to get your attention. And you're going to get it, and he's going to get his attention. I hate to say that. I think if my kids got to put their hand on the hot stove to find it's hot, but you know how we are. I say we, I mean you, me. Somehow or another, we always learn best by just like to get killed. <laughs> and then we get the message. And some of you think, well, the folks are that way, but I'm not that way. I'm not too sure about some of you. I stand in doubt of you. <laughs> A man said one time, he said, where was God when my little boy was killed? My son. And a fellow said the same place he was when his son got killed. You don't think about that, see, at the time. Lord, to one of my boys, I wouldn't think about it. Come to me later. Where was God when my little boy was killed? Where he was when his own little boy was killed? Stand them back. Let the thing go. Tell me something. If God stood back and let you crucify his only begotten son, how can you ever feel like God feels unless you go through some of that? You talk about knowing God and being like God, you can't be the least bit godlike without suffering. How in the world are you going to be like God if you never suffered anything, never felt anything? He has a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Thirdly, God Almighty let sorrow and suffering come to you to make you humble, bring you down. You have to be shown how weak you are, how sorry you are. And if you don't get that lesson, your, your own pride will not only cause you to suffer, it'll cause everybody else to suffer all around you. I mean, when a man's been humbled, he doesn't suffer himself because he doesn't feel frustrated. And when a man is humble, he doesn't cause folks to suffer around him with his egotism. God Almighty have to bring you down. You'll have to suffer to show you how weak you are. Let me ask you this. What good did Hitler's pride do the world? 
just caused untold suffering. You couldn't, you couldn't even calculate the suffering of one man who thought he was something. What good does the Pope's pride do him? Pope John Paul letting people die down and call him Holy Father and kiss his foot. My, the suffering and misery that rascal has caused. My, the poverty-stricken populations and people who can't take care of their children, the disease and the superstition and the murder. Pride! Holy Father. Holy Father, your foot! That's a title reserved to God the Father. Too bad the Lord didn't take that old proud, self-righteous rascal and rub him down the dirt so you can see what kind of a man he is. I heard of a case one time where a rabbi and a cantor and a janitor were cleaning up the synagogue, getting ready for the Day of Atonement. And they're working around the synagogue there, and the cantor began to pray, I am nothing, I am nothing. You know, and then after the rabbi began to pray, I am nothing, I am nothing. The janitor heard it. He began to pray, I am nothing, I am nothing. And the rabbi said, look who thinks he's nothing. <laughs> pride, pride. So he'd already made up his mind the other guy was nothing. <laughs> I'll tell you something else. God will send suffering and sorrow to you to make you dependent upon God. You see what a mean thing for God to bring me down to where I just have to rely on Him. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have the resources He has? Do you have the contacts God has? Tell me, do you know everything God knows? Have you got all the contacts? He, can you get all the people He can get a hold of? Have you got the resources? Have you got the riches and glory of the Christ Jesus? Aren't those gods? Well, tell me something. What's wrong with him making you dependent upon him when he can give you all that stuff? So be dependent upon yourself. He'll let you suffer. He'll let you suffer. The old prodigal and the father I was telling you about, like I told you about, they're different than those things. And the old man didn't want him hanging around to be dependent on his life. He wasn't saying you've got to stay and do what you're told to make it. He wanted the guy independent. But he wanted the guy independent when the guy was right and when the devil wouldn't get him. And the boy said, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. He went. Oh, I'll tell you another reason why God lets us suffer. And why suffering? God has reason, but none of it's unreasonable. It isn't this thing where, well, if he could prevent it, he should. And if he, it isn't. It is. Listen, God can stop all your suffering this instant. You're sitting here this morning with a sore back or bladder doesn't work and kidneys that don't work and a liver that causes you trouble and migraine headaches and half deaf in ears and blind and pain in your left leg and pain in your right leg and arthritis. God can stop it in 15 seconds. Anybody knows God knows that. But God has reason for doing things. He doesn't act arbitrarily. God Almighty has reasons to minister to others. Second Corinthians chapter 1 says, God comforts us in all our tribulation or sorrow. We might be able to comfort those that are in any kind of trouble. Uh, you, I hear these folks talk so much, much about love and sharing the love of God and sharing this and that. Sometimes they make me sick. They make me sick. Those people, all those people never been through anything. They couldn't minister to anybody. They know what it's all about. I get reading poetry sometime about mothers lost little kids and about daddies who lost their children and read poems sometime about heaven and I get weeping about it when I read those things. And you say, why is that? Because to me it's real. You say, why it's so real to you? Because I've had to minister to people for years who've been through those things. I never had any heart till I got saved. I had a stony heart, boy. Just like a brick, man. Like a brick. I also mean didn't love myself. And let me tell you, when God saved me, he took out that stony heart and gave me a heart of flesh. I'd go down and sit down by my bedside, the little 12-year-old girl dying of leukemia, trying to push the oxygen tent away and saying, Mama, take this away, take this away. I'd be in living rooms and Mama and walked up and down the floor with a five-year-old baby in her back, patting the baby and saying, the baby saying, Mom, it hurts. Mom, it hurts. Mama, stop it hurting. Mama, call the doctor. Mama, why does it hurt? You get around that stuff four or five years, man, eat your guts out, boy. Eat your guts out. Man, I've had them come by at 12 o'clock at night, knock at the door, stand there, tears running on their face. Brother Ruffin, we got to tell them Mom and her boy was just killed and get in the car and drive out someplace at 12.30 in the morning and some woman come out and fix your coffee about 
50 years old, sit there and tell her the news. A boy, 20 years old, just got shot, messed around in some marriage, messed some with a strange wife or something. And I've seen a woman sit there and just stare across that room and stare across that room and stare across that room. And after a while, look up and say to me, well, Brother Ruckman, I just want to thank God for one thing. And I think to myself, what in the world is this going to be? And she says, well, one of your young men out there at your school led my boy to Christ two months ago. You get around that stuff after a while, boy, they'll be going to wear you and eat you out. Folks, the old Ruckman doesn't have any heart. Yeah, I got a heart. You bet your life I got one. It's soft, too, boy. It's soft. It's been hammered and beat on, boy. And I'll tell you who beat on it. The Lord beat on it. Amen. Nobody else. Nobody else. You got to minister to others, you're going to hurt. You don't hurt, you can't minister. Our test more than night, Brother uh, Clipper gave me by a woman named Florence Zittler. She's a society woman up in Massachusetts. And she's raised in the back end of a store in the humblest beginning and made up her mind when she's about six or seven she's going to accomplish great things and uh, achieve all of her goals. <laughs> so she set goals for herself. And the first one was education. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa in college, all this and that. And the second one was fine clothes. She got that. And the third one was good money, and she got that. And she finally married a fellow who was a semi-millionaire. When she got to be about 30 years old, she had a little boy. And there she was with her husband making about 150000 a year, and her making about 80000 a year, and all these fine brick things, you know, out there with 15 acres and three stories and all that kind of business. Had it made, got all her goals, and she said, look back, and I saw I'd achieve every goal I'd set for myself. And then she began to have trouble with a little five-year-old boy. And the doctor had to bring it down there, a five-year-old boy, and he said, it's hopeless. He's going to lose his mind, he's going to go insane, he's going to have spasms, convulsions, he's going to die. And she said, what do you mean, hopeless? He said, uh, hopeless. She said, what does that mean? He said, hopeless. <laughs> she didn't know what the word meant. Listen. You sitting here in this building this morning, if you don't know what that don't know what that word means, you're not a Christian. Do you know how you get saved? By realizing you're hopeless. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. I mean, how many of you are hopeless when the Lord saved you? Let me see your hands. Amen, brother. Without hope, without God. Now listen, if you still think there's some hope, you're not getting anybody but yourself. And she went back and she said to herself, I just don't know, I wouldn't accept that word, hopeless. And the boy spasm, banging his head in the crib, chewing his nails, eyes popping out, swallowing his tongue, took him off, committed him to institution. She went out there six months later and saw him dead there in the bed before the funeral, his head all bruised up and banging, he banging his head in the crib. And she said, I looked at him and suddenly a thought occurred to me, he's dressed in charity clothing. They didn't, they forgot to send clothes. They just didn't think about it. They didn't send any clothes. So the clothes that little boy had were just given to him, poor folk stuff. So they made up their mind to have another boy, and they had another boy, and they had another boy. Beautiful, healthy looking kid. Got to be about eight years old. Brought him to the doctor. The doctor said, it's hopeless. He got the same thing. And she said, it, it can't be hopeless. He said, it is. I'll make a long story short. That woman got saved. About time. About time, lady. About time. You know what she says? She says her and her husband have spent most of the time going down the country and just trying to help folks out that lost little boys and girls like that. They can minister to others. You know why they can minister to others? Because they suffered. God sent one man this world without sin, but, brother, he was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, ministering to others. Here's David Brainerd out ministering to the Indians. Licensed to preach at 26. Engaged to a beautiful girl, uh, Jonathan Edwards' daughter. That ever got married. He died before he was 32. Died of double pneumonia. Preaching the Indians. He wouldn't marry the girl and make her suffer the hardships he had to study. Quickly worn out uh, through long rides on horseback, wilderness hardships, lack of proper fruit, overwork, never well one of you. Diary, quote, shattered with the violence of the fever, I felt my bodily strength fail. Distressed with an extreme pain in my hand, a tenable sickness in my stomach. Next entry. My body inexpressibly weak, followed uh, continually with ague and fever. Also suffered from depression. 
In the morning I was perplexed with wandering vain thoughts, much grieved, judged and condemned myself before God. How miserable did I feel because I could not live for God. At 10 I rode away with a heavy heart to preach to my Indians. He learned the Indian language. He wouldn't speak to an interpreter. He learned the language of the Delaware Indians. Upon the road I attempted to lift up my heart to God, but was infected with an unsettled, wandering frame of mind and was exceeding restless and perplexed and filled with shame and confusion. I seemed to myself to be more brutish than any man, and I deserved none of God's presence. I preached to the Indians without any heart. In the afternoon I felt still barren. I began to preach, and for about an, an hour I seemed to know nothing and to have nothing to say. But soon after I found myself a spirit of love and warmth and power to address the poor Indians, and God helped me to plead with them to turn from all their vanities to the serve the living God. He's out there ministering to others. I'll read you three entries in the diary. Quote, Was taken this morning with violent gripping pains. These pains were extreme and constant for several hours, so it seemed impossible for me without a miracle in 24 hours such distress. Was exceedingly weakened by this pain, continued to so for several days, followed being exercised with a fever and nocturnal sweats in this distressed case so long. Another entry. Uh, my strength began to fail exceedingly, which looked further as if I had done all my work. About two I went to bed, being weak and much disordered, lay in a burning fever till night without any proper rest. In the evening I got up. I had the uncommon kind of a hiccough, which neither strangled me or threw me during a strain to vomit, and at the same time was distressed with griping pains over the distress of this evening. One of his entries right near the end. He's ministering to people. In the snow and the cold and the winter, the Indians ministry, suffering. There's a purpose in it. There's a point in it. It isn't for nothing. God could stop it. God isn't going to stop it. The man's going to minister. Oh, I was made for eternity. If God might be glorified, bodily pains I cared not for, though I was then in extremity, I never felt easier. I felt willing to glorify God and that state of body distress as long as he pleased I should continue. The grave appeared really sweet I longed to lodge my weary bones in it, but oh, that God might be glorified. This was the burden of all my cry. Oh, I knew that I should be active as an angel in heaven, and I should be stripped of my filthy garments, so there was no objection. But oh, to love God, and oh, to praise God more, to please Him forever, this my soul panted out. That's a boy suffering. That boy's hurting. You say, what for? For others? Suffering for others, ministering to others. You understand that, don't you? Some of you, some of you parents here, haven't you? Got gray hairs in your head worrying about a wayward child? Your life for theirs. Have some of you parents denied yourself food and clothing for your kids? Your life for theirs. You understand it, don't you? Suffering for others. Haven't some of you parents suffered something for your kids? It isn't without purpose. It isn't without point. It's to suffer for others. So they don't have to suffer. The stuff isn't pointless. It's never pointless. All right, finally we come to the mysterious form of suffering. There's some form of suffering you can't get your hand on, you can't explain. Like Job. The only explanation for his was an attack by the devil, and you wouldn't know that if God hadn't showed it to you. You think about roll-off up in a plane coming down and crashing with those girls and the pressure of that thing exploding that body with piece of body all over the place. What a terrible way to die. Folks say, why did God take Roloff? I have no idea why he took Roloff and left Stuart Custer. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea why the Lord took Roloff and left uh, Truman Dollar. I have no idea. I don't know why God always seems to take the good ones. Like Bob Jones Sr., take him out. And leave the rest of some of these schmucks we got. But God knows what he's doing. Those things are mysterious. They can't be explained. How do you explain sitting on a Korean airline on a passenger trip and then being blasted in eternity when you had nothing to do with anything con concerned with it? There are mysterious things about some of those deaths. You take Joseph down in Egypt, and Joseph's down in Egypt, and he doesn't know why he's down there. He doesn't find out for 20 years. And in 20 years, he finds out. This tells me something. This tells me there's a future state of retribution. Brethren, not everybody gets caught down here. They get caught later. Not everybody gets the rewards down here. They get them later. You know, I know, you know, I know these communists and humanists and evolutionists are dangerous, wicked people. Because if there's nothing ahead, get what you can now. Tell me something. When 
When the poor man was outside the rich fellow's house begging with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table and there was no paradise for him to go to and no better life, why not just break in the rich man's house and steal what he had and kill him? Well, that's the communist approach. They don't have any future life. I've got a future life. They don't all get caught. Time and chance happen to all. These politicians and communists and evolutionists never speak of heaven, they never speak of hell. They cause suffering without alleviating it. They cause suffering and they suffer themselves because they reject what God said about suffering. Politicians and communists and humanists reject what God said about the reality of suffering, the cause of suffering, the purpose of suffering, and the cure of suffering. There's an eventual cure. And of course, you know what that cure is. You sang about it here. I have a home beyond the river. Here's old Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, inland mission. Who? Old mother, 17 years old. I cannot tell you, I cannot describe how I long to be a missionary, to carry the glad tidings to poor perishing sinners, to spend and be spent for him who died for me. Think, mother, of 12 million, a number so great it is impossible to realize it, 12 million souls in China every year passing without God, without hope in eternity. I must conclude, would you not give up all for Jesus who died for you? Yes, mother, I know you would. God be with you and comfort you. Must I leave as soon as I can and save enough money to go? I feel as if I can. I cannot live if something is not done for China. No one of that fellow got something done for China. Talk about suffering. His mother begged him not to go. His girlfriend begged him not to go. When those old boys started down there and his mother was screaming and crying and saying, Son, if you loved me, you wouldn't go. How do you like that from your own mother? Suffering. Overseas, Hudson Taylor buries one of his little girls. I'll close with this. Diary entry. Our dear little Gracie, how we miss her sweet voice in the morning. One of the first sounds that greet us when we woke and went through the day. As I take the walks I used to take with her tripping figure at my side, the thought comes anew like a throb of agony. Is it possible that I shall never more feel the pressure of that little hand? Never more see the sparkle of those bright eyes. Hurting, hurting, suffering, suffering. World's filled with it. World's filled with it. I dare say there are 150,000 men in that position right now this minute while I'm talking. No exaggeration at all. And yet she's not lost. I would not have her back again. I am so thankful she was taken rather than any of the others, though she was the sunshine of our lives. I think I never saw anything so perfect, so beautiful as the remain that dear child. The long silken eyelashes under the finely arched brows, the nose so delicately chiseled, the purity of the white features, all are deeply impressed in my heart and memory. Then a sweet little Chinese jacket, a little hand for it. You see, he went there to minister, and he suffered, and he lost his little girl. He buried his little girl, he buried her Chinese jacket because he was sent to the Chinese. There's a purpose. There's a purpose. It isn't blind. Her sweet little Chinese jacket, the little hands folded so hard to close forever from our sight. Pray for us. At times I seem almost overwhelmed with the internal and external trials connected with our work. One man without sin, and he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we seek the Holy Spirit to comfort in this hour, to comfort those that need to be comforted. We know our job is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And yet, Lord, we know we can't minister, really, not really, unless you do the ministering. You are the minister. You are the comfort. Like Brother McGee said last night, you are the helper. And, Lord, there are probably people in this congregation this morning need this help and this ministry more than I could imagine. I know I've spoken words of truth this morning, though I know they're only words, though. Lord, these words can't reach them unless you do something with them. They never get to the heart. Lord, there's some man, some woman here this morning that's never been saved. They've never seen their hopeless condition. They're still hoping, 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 hoping. And there is no hope. There is no hope outside of your son. And I pray you'll open their eyes this morning and may they see the sufferings of Christ dying for their sins, dying in their place, and trust him as a Savior. I'd like to have the organ play for us a few minutes while we remain in prayer. The moment we're going to stand and sing. I've been kind of long-winded this morning, but I need to be say these things. These things need to be said.
You're here this morning and I've been saved. Jesus Christ suffered for you. It wasn't meaningless to him. He did it for you. He did it so you wouldn't have to suffer. You say, Brother Ruppman, I'm suffering right now. Yeah, but that's temporary. And Christ suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring you to God. And you wouldn't have to suffer forever. I hope you'll see that this morning. And hope God Almighty speak to your heart about it. I hope you'll do something about it. Father, bless the invitation. And have your will and your way in the lives of each assembled here today. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand and sing, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. What number? 398. 388. Let's turn to 388 in the hymnal. 388. 388. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I'm waiting, you live still. If you're going through some terrible trials here this morning, and some of you probably are, you don't know what the answer is, maybe you ought to just slip down the altar and try it one more time and say, Lord, I want to know why. I want you to show me why. And I'm willing to straighten out and do what's right to get rid of it. And if you're not going to show me why, if I can't get rid of it, if it's something you just put on me and I've got to wait on a while about it, I want you to show me and get the burden off my mind and help quit worrying about it. Don't go out burdened. Don't go out burdened. Going out, no, listen, either go out the door knowing why or else have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. You can have a peace of God that's better than understanding why. But some of you, the Lord's after you for a reason. And you ought to find out. Oh, let's sing. Have thine own way. I was preaching a funeral one time down in, uh, I don't think it was Fisher Pew, I think it was the other one up there on Palafox, McNeil. A uh, fellow had been killed in a car wreck. He's about 30 years old. His wife was about 25. I remember at the end of that service, now the open casket, and people came by there.